peace and good morning world. Welcome to Foundation Radio. Thank you again for joining me on this lovely Tuesday. My guest today is the author of the book Nitro, The Incredible Rise and Inevitable Collapse of Ted Turner's WCW, which is arguably the most comprehensive and detailed analysis of any organization that's ever existed inside of pro wrestling and maybe even with sports world championship wrestling. Uh, Friends, my guest is Guy Evans. Guy, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Well, you're very welcome, Adam, and I appreciate the, the very high praise. It's a, a great way to start the interview, so thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. I uh, I don't know if I can if I can give as good of a praise as Eric Bischoff can, um, which is what initially struck me and got <laughs> me to uh, to want to read the book. Um, it's really quite incredible. It's 566 pages of just the most detailed mm. description of a, not just WCW, but I think just a wrestling organization uh, that I've ever come across. Um, I guess the best place for me to start on this would be what was the the genesis for you, and what what was the idea for you to 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 write this book? Like, where did the where did the idea come from? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll start out by saying that, like many other people, and I'm sure many people who are listening to this podcast, you know, I was someone who was made a fan in the mid to late 90s, uh, Monday Night Wars period. And, you know, I followed both WCW and the WWF very closely at that time. Uh, but actually, once WCW went away, that was really the extent of my interest in wrestling for, for quite some time. And I think if you go back and look at the TV numbers and other indicators around that time, you'll see that, you know, there were millions of other people um, who, who had the same thoughts and feelings at that time. And uh, strangely enough, it wasn't until, oh, I'm trying to think now, probably around 2009 or 2010, uh, when I became aware of, if you remember at the time, TNA um, going uh, head-to-head with the WWE on, on Mondays. I think it was a friend of mine at the time who kind of alerted me to that. And in the intervening period, I'd sort of followed um, on the periphery, I suppose, the wrestling business, and I was certainly aware of a lot of the the big stories during that time, but I wasn't actively watching it. Uh, But to make a long story short, I I was just kind of curious in terms of how uh, this product, this this TNA show was going to be presented on Mondays. And I, uh, you know, found it very interesting that a lot of the the characters that I had, you know, enjoyed back in that Monday Night Wars era were involved in this, um, you know, ultimately short lived uh, competition again. So uh, I kind of got into it, got back into it around that time. And I suppose that was when, you know, you asked about the genesis of the book. That's when I started um, knocking the idea around in my head to um, possibly explore the WCW story because, you know, I, I checked out some of the documentaries and, and other books that have been written about um, WCW. And I found all of that to be, you know, interesting and entertaining and informative in their own right. Um, but as someone who followed it so closely back then, there was a lot of questions that I had that I didn't think had been adequately answered, at least in, uh, in, in my opinion, from my uh, point of view. Um, and, and finally, probably around 2014, 2015, after kind of mulling this over for a few years, I, I said, well, you know what, um, if no one else is going to write the book that I think should be written about this um, very um, you know, pivotal, pivotal time in the wrestling business, um, then I'm going to give it a shot. And uh, little did I know what a monster you know, the project was going to turn out to be and uh, certainly couldn't have, re- could, could, couldn't have predicted the, the response you know, that, that has happened since that time. It's quite incredible, guy. I got to be honest. I, I, you know, I went through and I, you know, I did my research on the book and I, I've read the book. I have it actually sitting here in my lap as we speak. And there's about 120 interviews that are inside of this book, which is just, I mm-hmm. mean, it's unbelievable. You know, the, the, the familiar names are there. Kevin Nash, Kevin Sullivan, Eric Bischoff. But a lot of like really in-depth people that were inside the Turner organization were a part of this book. How does someone who is writing something like this or, or even not even involved in, you know, not just the, the professional wrestling business, but also in something as, as monstrous as Turner broadcasting, where do you start in order to reach out to these people and say, Hey, I'm writing this amazing book. Cause I'm sure it was really difficult to contact a lot of these folks, especially because the prevailing narrative, at least in, in, in from what I can tell with inside of Turner broadcasting and AOL time Warner, which it became was that they really didn't want anything to do with WCW. So in my head, the idea of these people opening up to you in a way that, you know, they want to talk about this business is probably not <laughs> the first thing on their list, right? 
Well, you know, I, I agree with you. I was as surprised as, as you are in terms of the access that I got and how far I, I was able to go into the organization and, and speaking to some of the key decision makers that were involved not only at the level of WCW, as you mentioned, but the, the broader corporate entity of Turner Broadcasting. Um, I suppose, you know, timing certainly has something to do with it. I think if I had come along and tried to write this book, you know, two or three years after the WCW sale, first of all, from a contractual or, or legal, you know, standpoint, there were, there were still, um, you know, at, at that point, a, a number of loose ends that hadn't been tied up as it relates to WCW, the company. A lot of the key people that are interviewed for the book were working for other organizations during that time. And also, you know, there were a lot of bad feelings um, that certainly existed for, for quite some time after, um, after WCW was sold, because let's not forget, you know, we all saw this from a, a programming standpoint as viewers. You know, that last year and a half to two years of the company was not a pleasant experience for those working in the company either. So, uh, you know, I think if I would have reached out to a lot of people on the WCW side, uh, you know, in the first five or six years afterwards, they, they certainly wouldn't have talked. Um, but no, you're absolutely right. I mean, I was blown away um, at, you know, the fact that a lot of these sort of shadowy figures that we'd heard about over the years, whether they be, you know, Jamie Kellner or, or Harvey Schiller, people of, of that ilk, um, opened up and, and offered, you know, so much of their time and insight to the book. And, uh, and I think, you know, without their input, quite frankly, it wouldn't be, you know, one tenth of, of the book that it is. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think it's I think it was important for me in order to get the full picture. And as as you know, our friend Eric says, context is king in order to get the entire profile of what was happening in the organization, not just from that viewpoint that we see as as wrestling fans uh, to get the back end story of that. I mean, that is I, I don't I don't know if I if the story could have been as propelled without that knowledge. I, 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 I as I was reading the book, the one book that came to mind for me a, a lot was this book that I read uh, by Bill Carter called The War for Late Night, which was the book about Conan O'Brien and Jay Leno's mm. tiff back in 2010. And for someone like me, you know, who's a mm. fan of of of, you know, of television and professional professional wrestling in general, these stories interest me in ways that I don't know if I can put into words. You know, like, like there's just something so detailed and so fascinating for me as, as the viewer, um, you know, and something is as extravagant as, as, as Leno and O'Brien. I mean, and then also the, the seeming implosion of WCW when they were at its peak, it's just such a fascinating and rich story. And it really did deserve this kind of analysis and in-depth uh, research that you did. And I, I just, I, I am, I am blown away by the work and the the caliber of work that you put into this. And it's just, it was a page turner. I couldn't, I couldn't put it down. Uh, one question I did want to kind of circle back well, to though. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Gag. Guy, go ahead. Well, well no, I was just going to say, Adam, I, I really appreciate the kind words, you know, and it's, it's obviously, uh, you know, gratifying for any author or anyone who produces any kind of creative work to, to hear those kind of things, because, you know, it was a, it was a lot of work. It was a lot of uh, <laughs> a lot of late nights, you know, some sleepless nights, wondering if this thing was ever going to get done. So, uh, so I just want to say, you know, that's uh, all well noted, and, and I appreciate it. Absolutely. One question I did have before we start kind of getting into the nitty gritty of the of the book itself and the story, and some other questions I have as sort of a, a tie on. Is there one person that you wish you would have spoken to? Uh, one person that you wish you would have had a, a contact with or anything to get their version of the story, whether it was inside of Turner Broadcasting or inside the works of WCW or maybe even someone from WWE. Yeah, I, I suppose the ultimate get, so to speak, would have been Ted Turner himself. You know, that would have probably been the uh, the icing on the cake as far as completing the story to get some input from Ted. Um, I can tell you that that wasn't from a, uh, you know, from a lack of trying, you know, I certainly spoke to many people who are, are very close to Ted even today um, about that and, you know, made, a, made some attempts through a few different avenues to make that happen. But I became aware fairly early on in the process, this was probably in the first year or so of writing the book about some of Ted's health issues, which have since been, been made public in the last couple of years. Um, so I was kind of told by a couple of people it would probably be a no-go because of that. Um, I think I was able to speak to enough people who were close to him and who worked with him quite intimately within Turner that I would like to think that I was able to make up for it. Um, I think somewhere in the back of the book, I don't remember exactly where, but there's a, a statement 
um, that I was able to get from his his foundation, which I think was was something nice to include to kind of round out the story a little bit. Um, and I, I think that's one of those things. Unfortunately, that ship may have sailed. Um, you know, again, due to his his age at this point and, and the health issues and so on. But um, to be able to to get him, you know, to sit down on the record and and talk about this particular subject would have been fascinating. I suppose what you also have to keep in mind, um, however, and sometimes I think this is um, difficult for us as as viewers and fans to keep in mind, is how much time has actually gone by since these events actually transpired. Because now nowadays, of course, we have uh, the network and YouTube, and there's so many podcasts that, that cover um, these these you know really important and, and great events, and uh, often it feels like you know these things uh, just happened yesterday. And sometimes you sit down and realize we're you know we're talking about things that occurred you know 25, 30 years ago. Um, so whether or not at this point he'd be able to kind of sit you down and, and talk in great detail about it, I don't know. Uh, but that's a, a long-winded way of answering your your question. I think he would have been. Um, you know, the, the perfect person to have the, the last word. But, you know, anytime you, you do anything like this, you go in accepting that there are going to be certain um, ambitions of yours or goals that, you know, aren't going to be met. And you just try to do the, the very best that you can to, um, you know, make the product as, as good for the reader. So hopefully I was uh, able to do that. Absolutely, guy. I think you. I think you nailed the the nail right on the head, or hit the nail right on the head. Rather, um, I think you were able to craft the voice of Ted Turner uh, appropriately uh, and in context, comparatively to maybe even having a sit down interview. But I felt like there was enough of his essence throughout the book and through the story that made up for that. But absolutely, I think I mm-hmm. think that would have been an incredible experience, not just even from the WCW aspect, just to talk to someone uh, uh, as legendary or as big as, as Ted Turner would have been incredible. Um, I guess we can start in a couple of questions that I had as I was reading the book. Um, and I guess maybe not to give away like that, you know, the, the full steed of the book here, but like in your opinion and your informed analysis, what was it? Because I know there's a lot of talk all the time about the finger poke of doom or, you know, David Arquette winning the title or, you know, Vince Russo as Vince Russo. Um, What was it? Was there one single event that you would point to to say this was it? This was the catalyst because Eric has been very uh, uh, vocal about the fact that the AOL Time Warner merger uh, with Turner Broadcasting was what the catalyst was uh, coupled with the creation of uh, Mm -hmm. Thunder. He's been very adamant about the fact that those were the things that that caused WCW to decline. In your opinion, after mm-hmm. reading this book and researching, what is your take? What was the moment that you knew, you know, WCW is tanking and it's never coming back? Well, I think, we, you know, you have to separate uh, the, the creative side from the business side, right? So from a creative standpoint, and I kind of alluded to this earlier, if you look at the last 18 months to two years of WCW's existence, you know, there was comparatively speaking at the time, you have to, you know, put all of this, this stuff in, in, the, in the context in which it was happening. If you compare what was happening on WCW shows to that composition at the time, again, not retrospectively, you know, looking at these events through the filter of 2021 and what we like and what we don't like, but if you go back and you know, look at the, the the crowd reactions, look at the TV numbers, look at the pay-per-view numbers. Um, you know, clearly the, the company kind of uh, bounced around from one desperate idea to another in those last couple of years. And, you know, I've said this before, but it was, and I think this this observation was first made by uh, Ed Ferrara, actually, who uh, was one of the writers with Vince Riso, but the following observation, which is, it was almost like clockwork in those last 18 months, especially, where every three months, if you remember, there was this gigantic reset and it was a, a creative restart. And it was almost like, you know, forget everything that you've seen over the last two months. This is the new WCW now, right? You think about October 99, you know, Vince Russo and Ed Ferrara come in. Then January, three months later, you know, Vince Russo is sent home and we have Kevin Sullivan, uh, you know, taking a, a, a much uh, more pronounced creative role with his committee. And then three months after that, here comes, you know, Vince Russo is back again and Eric Bischoff is with him. It's the supposed dream team that is going to turn everything around. Three months after that, we have Ash at the Beach and Eric Bischoff is gone. You know, Hulk Hogan's gone, gone for good. Uh, three months after that, October of 2000, you know, Vince Russo is, is sent home with an apparent uh, concussion and, and he's not involved with the creative process anymore. 
three months after that, January of 2001, this is the apparent takeover or purchase of WCW by Fusion Media Ventures, and Eric Bischoff is, is back in the saddle. And then almost three months after that, about two and a half months or so, so you know, WCW is, is sold uh, to the, the WWF at the time, and that's the end of the company. So under those kind of circumstances, you have to ask yourself, you know, how in the world could anyone, regardless of their creative aptitude or, or brilliance when it comes to the wrestling business, have produced any sort of compelling, consistent programming when, you know, the pattern was there that, you know, if, if we don't turn this around in a few weeks or, you know, a month or two, we're going to blow everything up and go in a completely different direction. So I say all of that to say that, you know, I'm sure subjectively we could say in the last couple of years, there's some things that, you know, as fans we liked and some angles of the storylines we thought that was great, but um, just to look at it, you know, as objectively as possible, clearly what they were throwing at the wall was not working anywhere near to the same degree that it was when WCW was really competitive and ultimately um, very successful in the head-to-head -head competition. Um, as it relates to WCW as a business entity or a component within Turner Broadcasting, I think my view after speaking to so many people and researching this and, and writing the book is, you know, the, the further away Ted Turner was from having uh, control over WCW and its, and its existence as part of the, uh, the, the Turner empire, um, the more likely it was that WCW was was going to end end up, uh, you know, not on those those networks anymore. Um, I think what you saw was when the company uh, really started to to catch fire and become, you know, the highest rated show on cable TV and become this pop culture phenomenon. All of a sudden, all of these, not all of them, but some of the executives that you made reference to before you know, were huge backers of WCW and, and came to the shows and, you know, were, were singing the praises of, of Eric Bischoff and everyone else involved. Uh, but the second that, you know, things started to head in a negative direction, there was no one in those kind of positions that was going to say, look, you know, uh, this is a, apparently, you know, if, if you believe the cliche, a cyclical business or, you know, this is a, a situation where we're having a downturn, but with some time we can, we can turn things around. There was no one who was going to say that. So um, I think it was always a matter of time, especially with, with Ted um, not having the ability to stop ultimately what happened. It was a matter of time that once WCW started to struggle, that this was going to be the, the excuse that those people needed um, to get, the, get the, the wrestling programming off of the networks. And obviously, there's a lot of nuance to that. And I think the book you know, tries to cover that in, in great detail. Um, because, uh, you know, quite frankly, the people that made the decisions at the end were not involved, uh, you know, throughout the entire run on, on PBS and TNT. But, um, you know, that's that's my view. I don't think it was a single, you know, show or a single storyline that you can point to. Everyone will have their own opinion, you know, uh, as far as that goes. I think creatively it was kind of a death by a thousand cuts. And, you know, uh, more broadly speaking, you know, uh, Ted was always that, that person that could stop ultimately what happened from happening. And at the end, he wasn't in a position where he could do that. I think that's, um, you know, that's kind of the, the fairest way of looking at it. Yeah, I think, Guy, I think that's a really fair analysis. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think that's a really fair analysis of, of of the situation overall. Just listening to you run that back, and and I remember being just this this massive mega fan of of both WWF at the time and and WCW, growing up as an adolescent during the Monday Night War, watching them and being fully invested in them, and then just noticing a very sharp change in the programming and the quality of the programming mm -hmm. that was coming from WCW. I mean, it was very apparent. I feel like once the NWO became too big for itself. I feel like WCW kind of grew mm -hmm. and it, it it grew faster than it could uh, recuperate, you know, and, and change itself on the internal metrics of somebody like an Eric Bischoff. And that was something that, that kind of stuck, stuck out to me a little bit in the book as you talked about um, some of the ways that WCW couldn't really compete as compared to WWF. Uh, one thing that stuck to me was about the announcers pitching uh, the WWE, mag WWE magazine or the WWE website or the, tel you know, during the running commentary, whereas mm -hmm. WCW didn't have sort of that, 
uh, that those metrics in there. Um, the infrastructure of WCW didn't really seem to be up to par with WWE, which I think maybe could have caused some issues internally with trying to keep up with them. How much impact do you think that had on WCW sort of, you know, becoming too big for its pants too quickly uh, in its war with WWE? Do you think that had a larger effect than people sort of realize? Or did that was just that just another, as you said, death by a thousand cuts? Well, I think certainly if you speak to those who are employed by WCW directly, a lot of people will give you a perspective like that. Um, I know that one aspect of the business, which Eric Bischoff often mentions that a lot of other people do as well, uh, that was woefully unprepared for WCW's ascent as this, as I say, for, for a time, this, this pop culture phenomenon was the merchandising, you know, department, which, um, you know, I could probably take us into the, to the weeds here and get into a lot of the minutiae about that. Um, but that, that was not, you know, the setting of the size of company that WCW became, um, how that was, was structured. Um, I know a lot of the production people were often very frustrated at, um, some of the things that the company didn't do to produce revenue. Um, you know, just, just off the top of my head, I can think about, you know, talking to, uh, Neil Pruitt, who was someone who became a, a very good friend of mine, actually, from writing this book. He was a feature producer with WCW and famously the voice of the NWO. You know, I remember him telling me that, you know, so many occasions where he would um, plead with, with some of the higher ups and say, look, you know, um, just just give me give me you know, Ric Flair and, and give me uh, uh, the, the tapes of five or six of his matches. And we can easily put together a, a best of, you know, coupled with, a, with an interview with the man himself. We can do the same thing for 10 or 15 or 20 other wrestlers. You know, we can do compilations for the theme music. We can do all of these different things, which... I think you saw the WWF, uh, you know, ultimately do it at a, at a much uh, higher level, and they were able to to really capitalize on on the popularity of what, a lot of their biggest stars. Where it seemed like WCW was just not set up for that. Um, going back to, to to your earlier point within within the question, though, one thing that I find really interesting in writing this book was um, <clears throat> the effect of that NWO storyline as it related to WCW's perception within Turner. So what what I'm getting at here is, you know, the the book goes into a a great amount of detail and a lot of the listeners will know this already, but um, about the the perception of of WCW and wrestling more broadly within Turner. And and, um, quite frankly, it was something that a lot of the executives were were embarrassed by. Um, They were not uh, in in favor of this particular type of programming um, doing so well in, in the numbers. It was something that, um, I suppose was a necessary evil to them because of um, because of Ted and his support for it. Um, but once the the NWO storyline came along, this was kind of a a concept that some of these people could explain uh, or, or articulate to um, potential advertisers to other executives. You know, the idea that there are these these renegade wrestlers from the other uh, federation that are coming in to take over. You know, I know Brad Siegel um, in particular was a fan of. You know this this so-called idea of having a big concept that uh, could easily and readily be explained to someone who wasn't necessarily an adherent of the genre or someone who was a uh, a passionate weekly fan. You know, showing up and and tuning into all of the, the happenings on television. This was something they could understand. Um, the problem was, as you kind of alluded to, that the NWO became so big that um, I, I think that everyone involved, you know, from a creative standpoint, was just at a loss in terms of, you know, where to go from, from, from here. You know, how do we pivot out of this NWO storyline? Um, you know, it was something that just went on and on to the point where the NWO, quite frankly, you know, didn't mean anything relative to where it was when it started in 1996. And I suppose you have to have some empathy for that. If you put yourself in, in the shoes of the people involved, you know, if you come up with um, a creative idea that's so uh, brilliant and really helps to propel your company, um, you know, it's it's kind of a, a it's easy for us to look back and say, well, they should have ended it here or ended it there. But in the moment, I think it's it, it, you know it's an extremely tough call because where do you go from there? How could you possibly uh, come up with something that would have the same impact as that NWO storyline? So I think that was another thing that didn't help you know WCW's fortunes either because a lot of the Turner people. We're looking for the next NWO type thing, right? Okay, this has kind of run its course. It's got a little bit stale. What else you got? 
and it, it wasn't enough for those people to hear, well, we're going to, you know, put on some great shows and have some great matches and, you know, sign these great workers from all over the world. They wanted the, the big concept that they could sell and pitch to these people that really were not uh, passionate about wrestling, but saw that it had become, um, you know, extremely popular on a mainstream level and wanted to cash in because of that. So uh, that was another thing that really didn't help WCW in the last couple of years. You know, I'm glad you brought that point up, Guy, about the uh, the idea of creating the next best thing. You know, the idea that NWO was so big and it was catastrophic in the industry and <clears throat> excuse me, catastrophic in the industry overall. It, it seems as though they were more interested in and maybe that's kind of the, the pitfalls and the pratfalls rather of, of being a wrestling fan now is. All of us are chasing the imaginary dragon, the high of the days of the NWO, you know, the days of the Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock right. and D-Generation X. We're constantly chasing for those things. I call it in, in my own life, I call it the uh, the, the mm. Pacquiao Mayweather, you know, uh, uh, dichotomy, right? You mm. finally get these two guys in the ring, <laughs> these these legendary fighters, that the, the, the Ali and Foreman of our generation. You get them in the ring and everybody goes, eh. You know, it's 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 like it's not going to yep. live up to those expectations. Yep. And you could almost in, in, a, in a current moment and we'll sort of get to this a little bit because I do want to pick your brain on, on one particular question uh, as it evolves to or as it involves to current wrestling. The idea of something like a CM Punk mm-hmm. inside of AEW. Everyone has these magical ideas of this mm-hmm. this great, uh, you know, uh, rejuvenation of the company and it's going to send them out into the stratosphere. But will it or is it just going to be something where we're like, OK, well, now we have CM Punk. We have the shiny new toy. The the uh, the coyote mm. catches the roadrunner. Now, what do we do? And we're constantly always I feel like as wrestling fans, mm. we we tend to hype ourselves up to the point where we let ourselves down. And I, it sounds like it's a lot of the same thing inside of Turner Broadcasting where it's like, no, we don't we don't want to build up the cruiserweight division. We don't want to see Chris Jericho on top. We don't want to see any of these guys do these things. Give us the next NWO. What's in your pocket? And from all accounts, it seems as though Vince Russo kind of sold the Turner Broadcasting and, 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 the, and the powers that be a bag of goods that he wasn't able to fulfill. Um, how much of an impact do you think Vince Russo holds on the creative? And as a sub question to that, what angle do you think hurt sort of the fan standing more? The Bash at the Beach 2000 incident with Hulk Hogan uh, and ended up becoming the shoot or David Arquette winning the WCW heavyweight title? Sure. Well, I think, you know, if you think about those first three months where Vince Russo came in with Ed Ferrara, um, there was a lot of optimism at the time. Uh, If you remember, it wasn't just the internet community that was aware that the uh, writers from the WWF were now with WCW. This was something that was actually picked up in some mainstream publications. The New York Times did an article at the time, Variety Magazine. You know, this is when you could argue that the um, WWF, WCW war was was kind of starting to take a little bit of a, a downturn, but certainly in, the, in late 99, um, if you go back and look at the numbers, still you know incredibly relevant and incredibly popular to the uh, to the to the mainstream sort of landscape. Um, and so there was a lot of optimism that this was was at, at the very least going to be something different. It was going to be a new direction, something fresh. I think ultimately what really hurt all of the um, or some of the progress that was made in those first two or three months was, if you remember, you know, the the uh, fans' understanding at the time was we're going to take all of these big stars off TV. Um, there's going to be a kind of a rebuilding process, but um, you know, at Starcade uh, at the end of of '99, you know, a lot of clues will be um, sort of uh, revealed, or, or, or a lot of uh, an idea will will sort of come forth as to where the company is, is going in the future. So there was a lot of hype around and a lot of suspense around what are they going to do at Starcade? It's going to be something you know revolutionary that's really going to propel the company into the new millennium. And if you remember, it was basically a rehash of the NWO. <laughs> so it's like, okay, we have this great idea, the NWO. The NWO, you know, was was certainly one of the the major catalysts in terms of propelling WCW to be number one in the ratings for so long. Uh, that got stale, you know, we didn't really know what to do. Um, the company was kind of a, a shambles creatively for a while. So now we bring in these new writers, it's a, a breath of fresh air, a new direction. Um, and then we go right back to the, the creative idea um, that kind of um, got, got us in, in, in that mess creatively. 
but this time it was it was watered down. You know, if you remember, there were Jeff Jarrett, the Jeff Jarretts of the world, and the Harris brothers, and all of these other people that weren't part of the original group. And so um, I think that's what, what really hurt, you know, a lot of the momentum that arguably was built, regardless of what you think of the content of those shows. And, and obviously, again, if you go back and, and look at that kind of booking, shall we say, or writing, it's so very different from how wrestling is presented today. Um, but, uh, you know, that was a big disappointment for a lot of people. Um, and, you know, there are people, and I think some of them have their voices heard in the book that will have the perspective that, you know, maybe we should have given that creative regime a little bit more time than three months, right? You know, you, you make this, this huge signing, you bring in, uh, Vince Russo on a, on a two year contract. WCW actually wanted it to be a three year contract. Russo, um, you know, at that time wanting to get out of the wrestling business insisted that it was a two year contract. And he comes in with his writing partner and, and up, up, you know, lifts or uproots his whole family, moves to Atlanta. And, you know, 12, 13 weeks in, you say, no, we've, we've seen enough. We're going to go in a different direction. So, you know, there are some that will say, well, yeah, you know, uh, of course, because the programming didn't live up to the expectations. There are others that may say, well, you know what, maybe he should have been given a little bit more time. Um, to go to your the, the second part of your question, I would have to say, you know, the David Arquette incident was 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 more damaging um, from a from a creative standpoint. You know, as it relates to viewers' perception of the direction that WCW was was heading in, because that was only a couple of weeks after we mentioned this earlier. You know, the resets and the restarts. Probably the 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 most profound example of that was the April tenth, two thousand Nitro where for the first time Vince Russo, you know, appeared on screen. If you remember, they had all of the wrestlers in and, and outside the ring. And uh, they were very much, you know, blurring the lines between reality and fiction and talking about the fact that, you know, there is a writer and this, this show is put together behind the scenes uh, and it's going to be done in a very different way now. And they stripped all of the titles and, um, you know, that show is, is chaotic and, kind of crazy as it as it was, you know, was was pretty well received at the time relative to what Nitro had been like for the preceding, you know, few months. Um, so, you know, again at that time there was some optimism that this is this is at least different and it's building towards something. So then a couple of weeks later to to do the David Arquette stunt, um, you know, that was that was uh I think more damaging than the Bash of the Beach um, you know, Bash of the Beach show. Um, because there were a lot of fans that once again had, had become sort of sick and tired of, uh, not just Hulk Hogan, but some of the older stars at that time. And I think, you know, there, there was a feeling this could be used as a way to propel some of those younger stars in Hogan's absence. And then maybe down the road, you bring him back to, to work with some of these other stars. But it was kind of hard to, to figure out, you know, what they were getting at with the David Arquette thing, because if you, you know, and again, you know, I've never worked in the wrestling business. I don't pretend to to have you know been involved in that world. But again, to look at it from an outsider's perspective, if you wanted to generate some mainstream attention, why not just have him wrestle a match? Why not have him he could be a, a valet or a manager for someone? Why not if he has to win a title? Why why not win you know the hardcore belt or a title that doesn't really mean anything? You know, why did it have to be the the world heavyweight title? Um, and then you know, r- regardless of, of how you look at it. Uh, you know, the simple fact is, you know, two or three months later when, when Booker T is, is winning the belt at Bash of the Beach and giving impassioned promos about all of the work that he's put in to get to this point, you know, there were a lot of viewers saying, well, you know, 10 weeks ago, David Arquette, or eight weeks ago, David Arquette had this belt, right? So um, it, it's hard to make the argument that that didn't devalue the championship in, in the eyes of the viewers. So I would have to say, in my opinion, you know, that was that was a, a big mistake. You know, Guy, I, I can't believe I'm about to say this out loud, but the way you sort of presented Vince Russo and, and I guess for me as the fan, I'm looking at the Vince Russo booking and going, oh, my God, I can't believe this. Like, I can't believe I'm watching Beetlejuice on my television. But you made me feel as though <laughs> Vince Russo was treated and, and to kind of harken back to what I had mentioned earlier, the connection with the war for late night treated in a lot of ways the way Conan O'Brien was uh, when he took over the Tonight Show. I mean, he'd only had the show for six, I don't know, maybe three or four months before 
Jay Leno came in and said, hey, this isn't working. Let's let's go back to it. I wonder how things would have panned out mm-hmm. if they would have allowed both of these guys to sort of grow and 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 you know dig their heels in and, and allow that the creative juices to flow but i think at that point the way the at least for what i can see in the book and the way things things it sort of panned out overall i don't know if there was any saving it at that point once vince you know even before vince russo came in i think once the merger happened it seemed as though they had their minds pretty well made up um would you agree with that analysis I would say so because I, you know, I can distinctly remember, and a lot of this came back to me in talking to people for the book. Uh, again, I, I zero in on that last eighteen-month period because you, you mentioned the word fascinating before. I think that that last year and a half of WCW just so much happened, and so many crazy things happened on and off the screen. But you know, you could probably do an entire podcast just dissecting you know one week in the life of that company during that time. Um, but I, I can distinctly remember, you know, there was there was always a feeling that, you know, that we're going to be able to turn this around, uh, you know, with with the next, you know, big idea or the next shocking swerve or the next surprise or title change or what have you. Um, and I don't think there was a sense on on the um, on the executive level that, you know, uh, this was was going to be a rebuilding project and this was going to take a very long time um, to really make an impact. Um, relative to, to WWF's lead in, in the, the viewing figures at the time. Um, you know, you could, could have put on the, the greatest show ever with a million surprises and debuts and some of the best matches you've ever seen. You know, that wasn't going to supersede, you know, Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock and, and everyone else while they were at that, their peak at that time. It was going to be something that, that really um, was going to have to be a, a, a consistent um, you know, series of great shows, great pay-per-views. And I mentioned pay-per-views because I think that's an element of the WCW story that often gets neglected in terms of people's analysis of it. Um, you know, certainly if you go back and you look at the TV numbers, um, compared to where Nitro was at its peak, you know, those numbers in the year 2000, for example, um, you know, are not particularly impressive. But But if you look at them, you know, as compared to Nitro when it started and, and uh, certainly compared to the audience, you know, viewership for wrestling today, although it's that really is, to be fair, an apples and oranges comparison because so much has changed in terms of how people consume content. But um, the point nonetheless is there was still a relatively um, dedicated, you know, uh, group of a uh, sizable group of millions of viewers who were more than, than happy to tune into Nitro and thunder, you know, on a weekly basis. Where there was really a dramatic fall off was the percentage of those people that were willing to actually pay money to see the WCW product. That's what really fell off a cliff from a from a revenue standpoint. Um, you know, WCW's pay per view numbers in those last eighteen months and, and uh, last couple of years, um, and so the, you know they were ne- never able to string together. Um, a number of big shows, um, you know, big pay-per-views that actually delivered. And I'll, I'll just give you a, a, a quick, you know, rundown just off the top of my head here, going back to um, this key period that we're talking about. So you think about, you know, April 10th, as I mentioned, 2000, that's the big reset. Everything's going to change. Um, so we get to the pay-per-view that following Sunday, Spring Stampede, right? So if you remember Spring Stampede, we have DDP and Jared in the main event. How does that show end up? It, it ends up with a shocking, quote unquote, heel turn, right? Kimberly Page turns on her husband, you know, aligns with the new blood. And in a shocking turn of events, you know, Jeff Jarrett becomes champion. So now we go to uh, Slambury, you know, in, in May. Uh, what happens at the end of that pay-per-view? Oh, it's a shocking, you know, heel turn. Uh, you know, David Arquette, you know, all, all, all along has not been this innocent guy who's you know, kind of uh, stumbled his way into a title run. Actually, he's turned on Diamond Dallas Page. And, you know, Jeff Jarrett wins that that main event. So now we go to the Great American Bash the next month. What happens? It's a shocking heel turn. That's how the show ends. Goldberg, you know, interferes in the in the main event against Kevin Nash and Jeff Jarrett. Um, and so I, I think, you know, you kind of see what I'm getting at here. When you do something that's supposed to be earth shattering on a on a monthly basis, you know, people kind of say, well, you know, I'm not going to tune into this anymore because when when a surprise in air quotes becomes predictable, by definition, it's no longer a surprise. So, you know, they would have really had to string together 
um, you know, a, a series for, for, you know, we're probably talking a, a year or two years of just really delivering on their, on their promises to have any shot of turning that thing around. And so that's where, again, you know, I think you have to have some empathy for all of those various committees and regimes that had a run for 10 or 12 weeks and were showing the door. I mean, how are you supposed to develop any momentum like that? I, I really don't know. You know, Guy, as much as I would like to sit here and talk about Vince Russo all night, um, I would like to shift my focus a little bit towards uh, the <laughs> sort of the second key player uh, in the WCW story mm-hmm. outside of Ted Turner, which is is Vince McMahon. I mean, you don't have the story. You don't mm-hmm. have the Monday Night Wars without Vince McMahon on the opposite channel doing the things that he was doing. Um, you know, obviously that the story and it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's it's it's, you know, the narrative it's it's out there, you know, 83 weeks. They're just kicking WWF's ass throughout those that timeline and that story. Uh, but I feel like perception is kind of everything. Uh, and Vince never really showed at least on television, that he was rattled. Um, one of the things that you mentioned mm-hmm. in the book was that the ratings may have been down, but their house shows, WWF's house show sales, were booming during that time before the shift that the tide mm-hmm. and the momentum changed. Um, how much damage do you really think WCW did to WWF? Because I know the legendary story is there about him. They had to pull the water coolers out of Titan Towers. And, you know, the, the obviously the Bret Hart mm-hmm. story when, you know, money was extremely tight, which led to the Montreal screw job. How close really was Vince McMahon to, to going belly up? I mean, was it as close as everyone says it was? Well, I think, you know, the, the, the problem ultimately was that the, the goalposts kept shifting. Uh, but by that, I mean, you know, if you go back to the, the start of the, the Nitro period, and this is where really the, the book starts um, in terms of WCW, getting the, the green light to go on uh, go on TNT. And there's a lot more nuance to that story, I think, than, than wrestling fans have been aware of before. You know, we've heard about this famous meeting between Eric Bischoff and Ted Turner, but actually there was a meeting before that meeting, which is where the book starts. But, um, you know, if you think about um, the beginning of this the story, uh, as detailed in the book, you know, the WCW, by virtue of... Um, you know, a goal outlined by Eric Bischoff was striving to become a profitable company. That was the measure of success, right? In, in 1995, uh, going into 96 was, can we actually be recognized internally for turning a dollar in profit? So then the, the goalpost shifted to, uh, we want to be the number one wrestling programming, uh, program on cable television. So they, they were able to do that. They were able to become profitable. And then they were able to become, for, for quite some time, uh, the most watched show on Monday nights. Where I think, you know, the, the company really got in trouble was when the, the standard of success became, you know, we're going to actually threaten the WWF's existence as a business. We're going to, and again, there's, there's a lot of differing takes here, but whether it's put them out of business or, or really put them under pressure where they, you know, can no longer operate as a, you know, a national or certainly an international company, you know, we can kind of debate over the semantics of that. But certainly there was a motivation to only do well for WCW, but, but do do harm, so to speak, from a business standpoint to the WWF. Um, and, you know, once uh, WWF was kind of able to regroup and stabilize and, and start to build their own momentum, um, you know, WCW were kind of boxed into a corner at that point, right? Because there was a lot of rhetoric that this was going to happen. They were going going to, uh, you know, uh, eliminate WWF from this competition. Uh, and once it became apparent that that wasn't going to happen, then, uh, you know, they were kind of, you know, trapped in a, in, in a vicious circle, I suppose, at that point by virtue of that rhetoric. So, um, you know, I, I don't know if, if it was quite as close as sometimes it's, it's made out to be to answer your question. Um, but there's no doubt that, you know, the WWF, you know, was losing money, lost up to six million dollars in in one in one year. Uh, you know, was completely bereft of creative ideas and direction. Uh, once WCW's you know success really started to take hold, you know, I can think of a, a story that I think is relayed in the book where um, I, I guess it would have been around September October of '96 when uh, you know on on Raw you have the fake Razor Ramon and Diesel. And I remember talking to, uh, you know, Buff Bagwell and some of the other wrestlers about this. And, and, and specifically, I can remember them telling me, you know, they remember seeing that on the monitor and kind of looking at each other like, you know, this, this 
actually isn't really good for us because these guys are so lost right now. They're so, you know, dazed and confused about how to counteract our programming. You know, we really don't want that to be one dominant wrestling company because there goes our, our ability to, to bounce these guys, uh, you know, off against each other and, uh, and leverage one offer, you know, uh, against another. And I, and I think that's maybe an underappreciated aspect, you know, uh, to this particular story as well is, um, regardless of, of how much, you know, the, the key, uh, managerial figures within WCW may have wanted that to be a reality. Um, you know, again, we can debate as to, as to whether that was the case or not. The fact is many of the wrestlers, if not all of the wrestlers, if they, if they really thought about it, wanted that to happen, right? Because, you know, it's not good for them for there to be a monopoly in the wrestling business. So, um, so yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, Vince McMahon, um, you know, uh, was, was very, very smart in, as the wrestlers would say, not, not selling the predicament that the WF was in. And, um, they were still able to maintain their, their paying audience on house shows and pay-per-views. And, you know, as, as you get into, 1997 and 1998, you know, a lot of that due diligence and hard work really paid off in the in the television numbers. Yeah, it seemed like Vince McMahon really had the long game figured out, you know, with the story and 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 the war and 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 ultimately, mm-hmm. as it's detailed in the book, is you know he he purchases his competition and and I guess it's just it's just such a fascinating sort of idea and, and it almost feels even in the book and, and thinking about it, sort of reflecting on it from, from where I was and just knowing how f- sort of abrupt it felt when Vince McMahon purchased the company. I, I just, mm. it just feels like all of a sudden that the shows get canceled and then boom, Vince McMahon buys, buys the assets and the, and the IP. It just, it feels like a very abrupt end, but also at the same time, it's like, well, I could have probably seen this coming a mile away. Yeah. It just, it just feels like it, it just, it, it's, it hasn't been something that has been replicated and you had mentioned earlier about tna sort of trying to go head to head and that's also spoken about in the book and now even in recent times with aew going head to head with nxt and now there's the talk of of daniel bryan and and cm punk coming into the fold with aew and a lot of talk about this idea about you know being the new outsiders coming into aew um, as a wrestling fan and then someone who has mm-hmm. studied this you know and, and really gone in depth on on a company going head to head with wwe um do you really do do you think that something like a signing of a Daniel Bryan or a signing of a CM Punk could cause the same sort of ripples and, 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 and as Eric calls it, the paradigm shift inside of the wrestling, this new wrestling world that we live in? Do you think it would bring sort of the same metrics and the same uh, view viewership change to something like AEW? Or do you think that the way wrestling is now and then sort of 20, 25 years removed from the Monday night wars. Do you think that's an even a, a possible feat to accomplish? Personally, I would have to say, you know, I, I don't foresee any situation where that kind of success, uh, whether it's mainstream popularity, relevance, um, you know, resonance with the general public, I, I don't see any situation in the near future where that can be replicated. And, I, and again, that's just my opinion. But I think that has as much to do with uh, the changes in, in the television business and across the media landscape as it does to what's actually happened uh, within wrestling. So, you know, the way that people consume media now is, is so different. Everything's become so fragmented. People are watching things, you know, on their own schedule at, at their own time. You know, quite frankly, People are, are finding ways to entertain themselves that uh, they weren't able to uh, weren't able to enjoy back in the in, in the time period that we've been talking about. And I think that really, if if you ask my honest opinion, has a lot to do with why pro wrestling, although um, you know WWE from a purely financial standpoint is doing better than it ever has as a company. And um, you look at some of the TV deals that have been made; it's, it's mind boggling to look at a look at those numbers. So. Um, from a business standpoint, you know, there's there's no way you could really critique what they're doing. But um, just from the perspective of an audience member, you know, I think that that has a lot to do with, as you alluded to before, why a lot of fans have that that feeling that um, these modern day companies are kind of chasing a, a ghost, really, that can never be caught. You know, I, I don't think you can really replicate what it was what it was like back then. I think because uh, you know media was so different uh, back then, and entertainment was so different, there was a an inherent 
uh, need to make your product accessible. Okay, so um, I, I I didn't come up with this expression, but I like to think of, of this expression. You know, wrestling used to, I would argue, appeal to the entire couch, meaning that if Ric Flair's in the ring doing a promo with with Mean Gene and he's taken off his you know his, his pants and he's dancing around the ring and elbow dropping the canvas, right? Um, you're going to have a, I would argue, you know, you're going to have a, a teenager watching that who's who's going to be entertained, right? You're going to have the, the mother might walk in the room and say, well, I've got to sit down and watch some of this. You know, the, the, <laughs> the grand, grandparent in the house, the grandparent in the house might be like, what, what the heck is this on, on my screen, right? A kid would find that enjoyable. And and ob- obviously everyone's enjoying that on, on a different level, right? The, you, you might have a wrestling fan in the house who's like, no, I'm, I'm interested in this because it's Ric Flair and he's awesome and other people you know, have their own reasons. But the point that I'm trying to get across is that I think wrestling was much more accessible back then. You know, you could watch uh, a portion of a show and kind of get up to speed with what's happening. And a lot of the, the presentation was done in such a way um, where it was designed, whether by intent or not, to appeal to the masses. And I think by doing that, it, it made the... Uh, the performers and, and everyone involved, um, it, it kept them honest. It, it meant that they couldn't take shortcuts. They couldn't assume that, you know, uh, everyone knows exactly what I'm what I'm talking about. And we did see a lot of that in fairness towards the end of the Monday Night Wars, a lot of the inside baseball kind of stuff and shoot references. So perhaps that's not entirely fair. But I think in general, the way that it was was presented and put together was with the idea of we're trying to draw as wide an audience as possible. Um, we're not trying to sort of micro target this to, you know, 800,000 hardcore wrestling fans. And the reason for that was, you know, the, the, the economics of the business back then meant that it wasn't going to be a sustainable proposition to do that. Whereas nowadays, you know, it's different. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's, you know, it's tough because obviously any kind of storyline that AEW does bringing in, um, those talents, people are going to automatically compare it to the NWO and the outsiders and everything else that they've already seen, which is a little bit unfair. Um, but I just don't know to what extent that would interest the, the the wider public at this point. You know, everyone's aware of of pro wrestling. Everyone's aware of WWE, certainly. You know, AEW, you know, less so. But, uh, you know, are you really going to get someone who's, you know, had a passing interest in wrestling or no interest in wrestling to tune in? Um, because of you know these these uh, these debuts, I'm a little bit skeptical about it. But you know what? I would love to be wrong because there's nothing more than I would like to see than um, you know pro wrestling really return to the place I would argue that it was during this time that we're talking about, where you had um, just so much emotion, so much excitement. You know, you look at the crowds back then. I don't think when Goldberg, you know, pinned Hogan at the Georgia Dome, I don't think there was anyone in the in the crowd saying, well, that was a two and quarter star match, you know, so I'm just going to kind of sit here and I'm not really happy with this. You know, I think once once you heard the, the three count, you know, that place reacted like it was, you know, at the Super Bowl or whatever analogy you want to you use, those people lost their minds. And uh, that's that's what I miss when I tune into, you know, contemporary wrestling is I think you ha- you have less of that kind of genuine, um, reaction and emotion of people losing themselves in what they're watching. And there's a temptation, I think, because of the internet, because of social media, and because of the way that wrestling is presented today, there's a temptation to always look at it through the lens of, you know, was this good booking or how good was this match? You know, what, did they do the right thing with this angle? As opposed to just sitting back and enjoying things, you know, as a viewer. And I, I would like to see, you know, some of that return. Guy, I couldn't agree with you more on that entire statement. I uh, I, I can only compare it to I, I remember watching Goldberg and Hogan live. Um, and I think I think the pandemic uh, coming off of the pandemic and, and back into the live shows offers each of these companies a really unique uh, opportunity to uh, bring back these, you know, these these opportunities to bring back stars and bring back uh, the excitement around. Mm-hmm. I mean, I can compare it to the best example, I guess you could get you could say now is is the John Cena pop at the end of Money in the Bank. You know, Roman goes over on edge and Seth Rollins is involved and he gives this final speech and then the roof mm-hmm. blows off of the of the stadium because John Cena returns. I mean, that to me 
I, I watched mm-hmm. that clip probably 30 or 40 times. It was just an incredible moment. And it gave me those memories of being a kid watching Sting come down from the rafters or watching DDP hit the diamond cutter, you know, on Hogan or any of these amazing memories that I have from wrestling as a child. I would absolutely love to see both mm-hmm. of these companies prosper and be successful and bring wrestling back to where it was in the 90s. And I I, I am in full agreement with you. I hope that I am wrong when I say, like, I'm not sure if it's going to move the needle, but maybe it will. And I'm excited to see what comes from it. But, Guy, I wanted to kind of tie back to the end of the book here and, yeah. and talk to you about this. Um, again, the, the, the feedback on, on Nitro has been absolutely incredible. The book is outstanding, and I understand it's actually going to be printed in hardback now, hardcover. When when will when will that be released? That's right. So we're, we're looking at the end of September. Uh, people can actually go to www.nitrobook.com. Uh, that's the only place that the hardcover edition is going to be sold, at least for the foreseeable future. Uh, www.nitrobook.com. Um, it's, as you mentioned, the, the hardcover edition to date, only the paperback and uh, audible uh, audio edition has come out uh, for the book, but this um, this printing is going to include actually a new forward from Eric Bischoff. He agreed to to write the forward for the book, and there's some bonus chapters in there that were not included in the original paperback edition as well. So um, it looks like we're going to hit the target for for late September or be very close to it. Um, and you know, if people are interested, definitely pre-order because I'm not sure how many um, how many uh, copies are going to be printed for the for the hardcover edition. So that's where people can go to get it. Well, you want to make sure you go to wcwnitrobook.com and place your pre-order for the book right now. Guy Evans, any final thoughts on WCW before, uh, before I let you go? <laughs> well, uh, Adam, I just want to say I really appreciate, you know, the opportunity and, you know, you're, you're more than welcome to reach out if you want to get me on the show again i'm I'm really uh really pleased that you reached out and uh happy to talk about this subject and uh just just very grateful and appreciative for for everyone listening and if there are people listening that have checked out the book um you know they've they've contributed to um you know a a level of success for it that, that certainly i didn't think was possible um and if people haven't checked it out you know wcwnitrobook.com uh for the hardcover but also you know uh, you can go to Amazon to get the paperback or Audible to listen to the audio version, which I think is about 17 hours of of content there if uh, if you have some time to kill. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, just uh, really enjoyed really, really enjoyed talking to you, and uh, would, would uh, definitely be up for it again. So thanks, Adam. Guy, thank you so much for stopping by to be on the show today. Again, the, the book is called Nitro, The Incredible Rise and Inevitable Collapse of Ted Turner's WCW. Guy Evans, thank you so much for being here. This has been an absolute pleasure for me. I have uh, been wanting to talk to you and pick your brain about this story since uh, I, I knew about the book and had an opportunity to read it. I would absolutely, absolutely love to have you back on. And um, thank you again. Thank you. Foundation Radio is hosted, recorded, and executive produced by Adam Barnard. The show is also produced by Sam Kreps. Special thanks to Greg Mead, Joe Keen, Jeff Quinn, and Dr. Ruth Almy. Our intro and outro music is produced by Dumb Ugly. Find this episode and our full archive at foundationradio.net. Follow us on Instagram at foundation underscore radio. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your favorite podcasts. This has been a Foundation Radio production. Butts Carlton, proprietor. Proprietor.